Okay, 30% success rate. I think that's good enough. Cool. Yes. <laughs> that's enough to pass. <laughs> right. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest, Connor Brown. Um, Connor is a senior level designer for some amazing games like God of War Ragnarok, Last of Us Part II, um, and is currently about to start working with uh, Rainbow Studios. Is that right, Connor? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So yeah, Connor and I, like I mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago, we worked together at uh, Bloxels or Pixel Press. Connor was a level designer for um, for Pixel Press, and we knew <laughs> as soon as we saw the games that Connor was making that he would go quite far. Um, and I believe at the time too, you're working on some Call of Duty maps, which were just really, really impressive, and that kind of kickstart um, people getting exposed to your content and your abilities. And uh, yeah, been working on God of War Ragnarok, Last of Us Part Two. So Connor's going to share some of his work. He's going to provide some insight into working in the video game industry and also share some tips on getting started as a level designer. So Connor, thank you for joining us today and I will let you do your thing. Sure, awesome. Yeah, well, um, just wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, I'm really excited to kind of, you know, uh, talk to you guys and kind of give you some insight on, you know, kind of what the games industry is like. And, you know, back when I was in college, um, we only had, I think, one or two people. I think I had a few professors who were in the industry that taught a couple of classes. Um, but I really wanted some more, you know, people who actually worked on the games currently and, you know, could give me some insight on like, you know, what the industry is like while I was there and what, uh, you know, what to expect when I when I got into the studios. <clears throat> so I think we had, um, I think we had somebody from the Saints Row franchise show up and they kind of gave an, a pitch and overview of kind of what their games were like and how they worked on things. And I solely remember that as like being with the one experience where I was like, okay, this is cool. Like these are the devs like right now um, talking to me about like how they do stuff. And so <clears throat> an opportunity for me to get to, you know, talk to you guys and kind of give you some insight on that. Um, I think is super valuable and hopefully we can do more things like this uh, in the future. So let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. Go ahead and start the slideshow. So let me know if you guys can see this. Is this good? Looks good. All right, sweet. Um, so yeah, uh, Matthew kind of gave me a little bit of an introduction, and yeah, we uh, we worked together um, for oh, about two or three years. Um, a while back uh, at Pixel Press and Voxel, so that's how we know each other. Um, but yeah, currently right now I'm a senior level designer. I'm going to be starting at uh, Rainbow Studios, which is a kind of a motocross racing titles, you know, a little bit different than um, Last of Us and God of War and stuff. But, you know, I kind of wanted to branch off and start doing some different designs, different things. Um, so I'll get into that uh, a little bit as we kind of go through this a little bit. Um, let's see here. Let me make sure this goes. Okay. So yeah, a little bit about me. Matthew kind of touched on some of these things already, uh, but I graduated with a bachelor's in game design at Shawnee State University in the uh, southern part of Ohio um, in Portsmouth. Um, and I was kind of there, you know, while I was there, I kind of worked at Pixel Press remotely. So I was kind of getting some experience while I was working there um, remotely while I was doing classes. And then I would go home and during the summers, I would work in the office with them there. Um, but after I was done uh, with my degree, um, and I was still you know, kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Pixel Press, you know, was a great start for me uh, to kind of get the professional experience, you know, work on a team and kind of understand how, you know, things worked a bit in like a game design environment. Um, but it wasn't what I was really going to school for. You know, I wanted to move on to work on to AAA titles, stuff like, you know, the things I've worked on last of us, uh, all those dark, crazy fantasy uh, style things. Those were the things that I, I was very excited and wanted to uh, pursue. So after um, I was done with college, I moved out here to Los Angeles to work at Naughty Dog um, in Santa Monica studio. Um, and that was a for about four years, I was about two years at each studio, um, give or take a few months. Um, so I was there pretty much after pre-production of, you know, where the game had started and kind of was, you know, at the perfect place to kind of start doing levels there and creating content. And like I said already, um, after I was done at uh, Santa Monica Studio, I'm moving over to Rainbow Studios to kind of work on some racing and motocross titles uh, after that. Um, so to kind of just give a background of how um, I got into level design. Um, I always knew that I wanted to work in games ever since I was a kid. Um, you know, I played Doom since I was six. I think my dad introduced me to 
all kinds of stuff uh, growing up. So I was, I've been a gamer for forever. Um, but I started to gravitate um, towards more sandbox games uh, as I was growing up, like Halo Reach. I, I don't even think I even played the campaign or the multiplayer. I just was messing around in Forge pretty much all the time. Um, and I always found myself gravitating towards games that I could create my own stuff in. So Little Big Planet was a perfect thing. You could do pretty much everything. I'm sure some, all of you guys have played some sandbox games like these. Um, and I always, you know, wanted to push myself uh, with the, the in-game tools there uh, to kind of create everything that I could want. Um, and it kind of left me, you know, yearning for a little bit more and wanting some more tools that create could actually like make games. Um, so after that, I'll kind of just go into my portfolio a little bit, just to kind of give you guys some background of the, you know, some of the stuff I worked on, give you guys some visuals of, you know, what's of what stages of my life I, I worked on different things. So kind of while I was in college, um, I didn't know that I wanted to do level design. I was there for kind of like a generalist start. So I kind of took all kinds of classes. I took um, character classes, level design classes, animation. Uh, concept art so I did some like digital painting because I was like oh maybe I want to you know get into like matte painting concept art because I, I loved drawing I took a bunch of drawing classes in high school so I was like maybe I want to do digital paint and messed around with some 3D sculptures ZBrush and stuff and making some scenes um, but I started to gravitate more towards level design um, and environment art so I started to kind of focus on that as things went on um, and then outside of my classes, I, you know, I had the typical like classwork class projects that we would do, like, you know, here, recreate this toy truck or something and make sure it uh, had all of its dimensions, you know, kind of teaching us like how to use the, the software um, and kind of get us used to the tools like Unreal Engine and, and Maya kind of throughout that. Um, but while I was working on those projects, you know, it, they were great uh, foundational tools to teach me how to use those, uh, the software, but I really wanted to, you know, just start getting into the meat of things and just see what I could create. Um, and so I think I started while I was a sophomore uh, in college, kind of tam like getting into other engines and stuff besides Unreal Engine. Um, and Call of Duty put out their, their Radiant uh, Black Edition editor for Black Ops 3. And I was super into Call of Duty Zombies, like ever since World of War when it started. And I was like, I, I just want to work on something like that. So that engine was perfect for me because the, the game mode was kind of already there. You know, I'm not much of a heavy scripter, so I could kind of use that to my advantage to already have the game made and I could focus on just the things that I wanted to work on, which was level art and level design. Um, and so that allowed me to kind of create, you know, all these mass levels and actually play them and have them function. And that kind of acted as a really good portfolio uh, piece uh, for me going forward. Uh, so you can ask any of my friends that I went to college with, they were like, what was Connor doing uh, after class was over? And I just came home to work on my map pretty much. So I kind of just know life just working on my personal projects a lot. Um, and uh, for me, working in the Radiant Engine, it's not like Unreal Engine at all. It's very like closed off. There's not a lot of tutorials. So it kind of forced me to, you know, kind of figure things out on my own um, and kind of try to, you know, figure out how things worked. You know, I had to start doing a little bit of scripting by myself, how lighting worked, um, how textures worked, how everything worked pretty much. And this was kind of a really great introduction into not just level design, but just how games were made. And it was a really good uh, way for me to make a ton of mistakes and mess up and have, you know, realize like, oh, I can't just put a hundred gigabytes of data into one area because it'll just crash. And certain things that you don't think about um, while you're making games, it was easier for me to kind of realize, you know, the, how wide of a, a range I could get with certain things. Um, so going forward, these are kind of <clears throat> some images of what it, it looked like. Um, <clears throat> and it really allowed me to create a, a foundational portfolio after I graduated college uh, to kind of use that to kind of give myself an edge above uh, my other classmates who were just putting their, their classwork in their portfolio. Um, <clears throat> and alongside that, I do a lot of just uh, personal sketches in Maya, stuff that you know I never take to completion, just you know, gray box, uh, block mesh, whatever you want to call it, um, just to get my ideas out on in a 3D space. And sometimes, you know, I never do anything with these and uh, they're just there. 
um, and I work with them. But sometimes when I'm working on future projects, I remember back to them like, oh, I did a sketch of a forest and, you know, maybe I can reutilize that for something else nowadays. So even if uh, you're making sketches and working on personal projects on the side, um, they, you can always reutilize them um, in future scenarios whenever you're working on stuff. So that's why I try to try to do those as well. Uh, alongside all of that. But to get into my more professional portfolio, like Matthew talked about, um, we worked on Bloxels uh, at Pixel Press and Bloxels Star Wars. So I was mainly a level designer there. I kind of did a little bit of everything kind of starting out. I started with them kind of when they were at a really early stage of Bloxels trying to figure out kind of what the game was. Uh, so I worked a little bit with, you know, some environment arts some character creation, some animations, but I was mainly in charge of, you know, doing the like on disc levels to kind of show people you know what you could do with the tools and what it was capable of um so like alongside that we did a star wars version that was crazy trying to work with the the licensing for that and you know i think one one thing that was crazy to me there was we created a boba fett character for that and his antenna was like two pixels or something on his head and we usually flipped and mirrored animations and some guy from disney said well you gotta his antennas on the wrong side of the helmet, you know, you got to go back and remake all those. So it was, it was fun, you know, getting to work with that license, but it was also pretty crazy, the restrictions working with that. Um, but that was kind of my last title uh, at Pixel Press. Um, and then I moved out, you know, to work at Naughty Dog on Last Was Part Two. Um, and so that was a completely different beast. You know, I went from working at a much smaller team. I think we were what, 15, 17 people probably at Pixel Press at the time. It always, you know, fluctuating around that uh, to a team of three to 400 uh, people. And that was a crazy switch for me. But, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I knew I was ready for that. I knew that, you know, there, I wasn't ever going to be fully ready to start working in AAA or in a larger studio. So, you know, uh, that introduction was crazy, but it also taught me a lot. Uh, going forward and kind of working at Santa Monica studio was very similar. So I'll kind of get into, you know, what that process was like, what the kind of day-to-day -day tasks and stuff and things I was in charge of. Um, so, but typically uh, for a level designer, uh, for both of those studios, you'd start off by just doing, you know, simple layouts, simple block mesh layouts, um, using like kind of low poly, like art objects to kind of help artists, you know, understand what your levels look like. Um, and at Naughty Dog, we didn't have uh, producer roles there. So level designers kind of acted as their own producers there. So it was kind of a half and half. I kind of worked on stuff um, half the time. And then the other half the time, I was managing teams, um, kind of overseeing everything that the level had to go through to get it to polish and to ship. Um, and that was a crazy experience, kind of threw me all over the place there. And um, it was quite the experience. And I'll kind of get into this a little bit more um, on the later slides, but these are kind of my duties while I was there um, and kind of worked on those levels. So I don't know how many of you have played Last of Us Part Two, but you know, without spoiling anything, if you haven't yet, um, I worked on a bunch of Scar Island parts. Uh, I worked on the skyscraper uh, sections, the descent, um, a bunch of the flooded city sections with Abby. Um, one of my favorite things I got to work on there was the horse chase. It was a huge uh, set piece uh, cinematic kind of near the end of the game with the burning village. Um, those were kind of the made the majority of the levels there. I worked a little bit on uh, Santa Barbara. Um, some of my sections got cut though. There were some narrative changes, but we reutilized some of them through there, but I had a little bit of influence on those. Um, and what's crazy is this is the first time I'm able to actually talk about what I worked on Ragnarok since it just came out, you know, most, for the past, I don't know, six months, I haven't been able to actually say which sections I worked on. Um, but pretty much at Santa Monica Studio, uh, worked very similarly to Naughty Dog. They're both owned by Sony. Um, the teams were, there worked pretty much exactly the same. I had the same responsibilities, except we had producers there. So it was a little bit more hands-on and not tasky uh, as much for level designers. Um, so, yeah, I know God of War just came out, so, you know, I'm not going to spoil any narrative things there, uh, but I worked heavily in Svartalfheim and Midgard. Um, so I worked on a bunch of different types of levels that I did in Naughty Dog. So I did a lot of puzzles, a lot of more open spaces, um, and then, you know, a couple of linear uh, driven narrative sequences on that. So that was super fun, 
super crazy to be able to work on both of those titles. Um, and I'll kind of get into, you know, what kind of things I had to deal with things I wasn't, you know, expecting, uh, going forward with these. And, uh, we'll kind of get into what level design is and what game design is for me, at least in my experience, uh, going forward. So, um, to start things off, um, what game dev is like, uh, a lot of stuff that I remember seeing a bunch of TV shows and, stuff where people were like in game studios and people riding around on scooters and there's toys and action figures everywhere and like bing bag chairs and that's totally the reality of it i remember um getting into the naughty dog studio the first day i was there it was super surreal you know you go up this elevator and then you walk down this hallway and there's all the statues and all the awards and all the all the different types of playstation editions that they have there and you know my first time going into the studio there's just people riding around on scooters going everywhere people just you know it's what you think a game studio looks like um and it's super exciting to be in that environment it's like you're there to be creative it's an immersive environment and you know everybody there is you know working towards creating this crazy product so it's definitely a surreal experience the first time you step into that space um and let's see here um Typically, you know, core hours, I guess my typical working day is 10 to 5. You know, it's a bit different now since it's a lot of stuff is work from home with the pandemic, you know, that changed everything. I'll get into that once I um, start talking about Santa Monica Studio. But usually you're expected around 10. You know, if you're 10 to 15 minutes late, nobody's going to care. Like as long as you're getting your stuff done and, you know, you, you're there during the main core time, you know, that's pretty much what's expected. Um a lot, another thing I didn't really expect as much uh, going into AAA is that there's tons of communication uh, between different departments. So like I knew I was going to be talking with, uh, you know, art and animation and tech, but I didn't realize the, the depth of how much I was going to be talking with those people. So it's a very, like, you get to know so many people there. Uh, I think I, I was meeting new people almost every day. The studio is huge. I said like three to 400 people, and that's just in the studio itself we do a lot of outsourcing work so we have other studios that we work with that like you know if we have a levels that have a ton of art that need to do we'll work with our um our uh, companies that we're partnered with like uh, valkyrie entertainment we worked with uh on santa monica studio kind of like how call of duty does like treyarch works with raven um there's a bunch of bunch of people involved and so you're always meeting new people always developing new relationships there um, and you know, it's crazy. It's, it's awesome to talk to these people who've been working in the industry for 15, 20 years. Um, and kind of like a lot of talk has been happening about crunch, you know, that's definitely a thing, um, at studios. Um, and so at Naughty Dog, um, I guess, how do I explain this as best as I can? Naughty Dog definitely, they didn't tell you to work crazy hours, but it was definitely expected of you to, you know, make it the best you possibly can. They were always like, you know, make sure you go home and, you know, get some rest, but make sure you get the work done. Um, so since that was my first AAA company, you know, sometimes I was working a hundred hours a week and totally unhealthy, but, you know, sometimes, uh, especially when you're really excited about working on a project and working on a level, you know, you're, you're there for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, being in that industry and especially that being, you know, my first experience there, I wanted to do everything that I possibly could to just get as much stuff there and as much levels to that I worked on as possible. So being surrounded by those people who've been working in the industry for 15, 20 years, it, it's crazy to, you know, people I've seen in, in credits and on tra like game trailers, like talking about the game, like they're just walking past me pretty much. And I'm like, oh, you're that guy that I've seen like literally on game trailers. It, it's crazy and it's a weird feeling at, at the start. And you, you sort of get used to that. It's, it actually took me a while to even like understand like how crazy it was, but um, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome experience to be a part of that. I would encourage anybody to get into AAA to, to be a part of that. Um, so that's kind of like the core pillars, I guess, of what, like, what it feels like to work in a studio. Um, but gearing towards more specifically just level design, you know, um, I'm going to be talking a lot about level design, but this also goes for pretty much any department you want to go into. Game design has a huge umbrella 
of different things that you can do. There's so many jobs. Um, and like, we have specific uh, designers that solely just work on like collision just around certain objects. Like that's their whole job title. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, different sub branches of design and other types of art uh, that you probably haven't even heard of yet. Um, and there's tons of things, tons of paths that you could take for that. But gearing towards uh, level design specifically, kind of our jobs of what level design is, is we're creating the world space, you know, we're making the geometry, you know, we're making the paths um, and pretty much the player experience. And a lot of uh, my tasks, uh, specifically at Naughty Dog, was, you know, they would give me a level. They would be like, okay, here's the, <clears throat> here's the narrative here. Here's the, the main story beats we need to nail. Here's kind of the environment that you're going to be working in. And that was it. Like, that was all they gave me. And I was kind of like given tons of freedom to be able to decide, you know, where the player went. Like, I had very little restrictions on that. And I like working like that. I don't like an outline. I don't like having a lot of rules. Um, and for me, that fits perfectly with what level design is. Um, there isn't a lot of rules and you're kind of the person who comes up with the outline itself. And then your team members who work on other teams kind of like in art and tech and uh, animation follow your rules that you have placed down uh, for everybody else. So as freeing as that is, uh, it does come with a lot of responsibility. You're kind of the person in charge of how the product feels at the end and how the, you know, is the player experience good? The pacing is, is everybody having fun? Is it accomplishing the goals that, you know, my leads and the directors really want to push here and especially working um, in AAA kind of AAA is kind of like a stamp of approval, right? When pe somebody buys a AAA game, they're, they're like, okay, this is going to be an experience that I know my $60 is going to be worth it. So a lot of time when you're sitting there and developing games for these AAA companies, you remember that millions of people are going to be playing this. Not even, not just AAA, even regular studios also. Millions of people are going to be playing through these spaces. So you got to always think the edge cases, like certain people don't play games the same way. So we had uh, a lot of times at Naughty Dog and Santa Monica Studio where we would have, I don't know, six to eight months probably of like, inviting people in and testing and having them experience the game. And I saw the most ridiculous, insane people who play games. We invited people who've never touched a controller in their life. Um, and those, you know, as frustrating as that is, you kind of see like, oh, there's not just people who've been playing games forever, but there's just somebody who wants to just experience a story. And a lot of what we're pushing nowadays is making things very accessible uh, for people, especially uh, people who, you know, can't play the same way others can. We've had somebody who's like completely blind play through uh, Last of Us Part Two and God of War Ragnarok to like finish the game. And we have tons of settings now that kind of, you know, open those experiences up to as many people as possible. So being a level designer also means creating more intuitive ways for people to be engaged and for people to enjoy the product. Um, so outside of that, um, I know you've probably all heard of level design, but there's different types of level design. Um, excuse me. So I've worked on, I guess, Last of Us Part Two and God of War were pretty, you know, linear narrative driven. We have we have this uh, phrase we call wide linear, um, which is you know you're pretty much set on a straight path, but you have multiple choices to go the way you want to. Um, and, you know, open world level design, kind of like Elden Ring. I don't know if any of you played that. I'm sure some of you have. Uh, uh, they have open world versus linear. They all have their, their different properties and level design is different for those. It's kind of like Skyrim. Like I'm super used to creating linear narrative driven spaces, but switching gears and trying to work on an open world environment is very different. Um, I'll kind of share an example with you here that uh, after I was done working um, on God of War Ragnarok, I applied to, you know, other places that did other types of level design, more open world spaces. And when I got into those interviews, like they asked me questions I wasn't even pre prepared to answer because I didn't know. Um, and so a lot of different types of level design come with their own 
challenges and their own problems uh, to solve. So just know that there's tons of different types of level design to get into, and they all come with their own properties um, to work through pretty much. Um, so kind of my main job, well, I wonder if that, let's go through. Okay, so yeah, pretty much what I'm in charge of as a level designer, kind of taking out the, you know, we didn't have producer roles at Naughty Dog. That's kind of very unique towards that. Um, but I'm mostly just a world builder level designer, uh, do some type of production work because I have to work with production to get my teams to follow their tasks. Um, and I do a little bit of scripting everywhere. Level design is a little bit different everywhere you go. So some people will have you do a lot of scripting, uh, some of it's syntax. Um, at uh, Santa Monica Studio, we had a visual script, kind of like Unreal's blueprint system. Uh, and for me, since you know, I'm not a super heavy scripter, you know, visual scripting was was great for me and it allowed me to actually do more scripting um, and kind of be more in charge of my levels there. And some places won't have you do any scripting at all. It'll just be solely just creating geometry. Um, so it all depends on what the studio you're going towards or you know what jobs you're looking at. Um, but the main part of my job was, you know, after I had done my sketches and layouts and I had kind of decided what the level was going to look like, um, we kind of transferred that off onto managing teams after that. So I was in charge of working with my animators, artists, you know, lighting people, scripters, tech design. Um, and kind of each level I was on, I had a team that worked with me specifically on those areas. And it was kind of up to me to kind of help those guys move the level uh, to the polish stays. Uh, so when I'm done doing my sketches, usually pass it off to art. Um, and I work specifically with artists, uh, you know, to kind of make sure that they have as much freedom as they need uh, being the art, you know, like uh, an example is at Naughty Dog, we had, uh, we had a bunch of combat spaces that in, <clears throat> in Last of Us, you know, the cover that we place in places is very specific for, you know, enemy routes that walk around um, and do their kind of paths. And so it's very important to uh, tell that to the artists and make sure that um, those combat spaces and the cover that's placed in those areas stays that way and kind of, you know, let them know where they have free reign to kind of do what they want. Uh, so it's a lot of back and forth uh, between that. They'll, you know, make an iteration, a first pass is what we call it. Um, and we'll like do a review on like where things are at. Is this, you know, kind of what, I had envisioned for the level going forward. Lots of things change once polish starts to go in. And it's kind of up to me to make sure that my vision of how I made the level at the beginning is still being seen through after art has gone in, the animations. Pretty much I want to make sure that my vision is only getting better um, with everybody else kind of contributing uh, to that. So on top of that, many iterations. Um, testing, seeking feedback from other people I work with. Tons of times, usually every other day, I'll just ask another level designer and be like, hey, can you play through this and you know, give me feedback on like how you think, how you think it plays? Because everybody's working on different things and everybody has different skill sets. Uh, level designers, you're pretty much, it's pretty much you're working with a bunch of cheat sheets, like and, uh, you know, different from being in school where you're working on a project mostly by yourself and kind of had to figure things out by yourself, you know, you've got a team of, you know, industry titans surrounding you where you can just be like, hey, like, you know, what do you have any suggestions for this? Like, is this pacing good? And they'll just give you their, you know, 20 years of an experience, the answers for that. So it's a very collaborative environment. And if you're ever stuck on something and, you know, you're wondering about something, always ask, like, that's, it's a very collaborative environment in that way. Um, and something I really enjoyed working on, on a team rather than just by myself. Um, and so I guess after iterations, yeah, I'm basically just in charge of how the finished product plays. Cause even though I've created the level, the sketches and uh, how the level works, I'm still kind of working with everybody until that level is completely done. I never really just pass it off and start working on something else. I'm involved in pretty much every step of the way, even with uh, the writing and narrative pieces, there were some things on, uh, at Naughty Dog, where I worked with the writers and I was like, hey, maybe uh, the story can be a little bit different here. Maybe we can have some side story that helps explain like 
why these villages are on fire or something like that. And, you know, that kind of process, not just as a level designer, but as an environment artist, you know, you do a lot of environmental storytelling with things like that. And everybody kind of has a voice on, you know, what to make the best experience for that level is. So it's very collaborative with that. Um, so my average day is kind of a hard one to explain because it's different almost all the time. Uh, my top three bullet points here are kind of like my just do, I do these all the time. Uh, so just, you know, begin my day, just looking at my tasks. We use Jira. Um, some other people use Monday, you know, other project management software. Um, so I just check out my tasks for the day, uh, see what I need to work on next. Usually I have a, just an evolving change list. So I'll have 10 tasks someday and other days I'll have a hundred and I'll just get like 20 new things overnight. Um, and it's up to me. I, you know, I work with my leads a little bit during our check-ins, but it's up to me to manage um, how many tasks I get done uh, throughout the week. And, you know, if I'm behind at the end of the week, you know, I, I relay that to my managers, you know, I'm like, maybe I have too much work or some things took a little bit longer than I thought, which is always the case. You'll never, there, there was a time at Naughty Dog where my lead would be like, how long do you think this will take you? And I'm like, oh, it'll take me like two days, like probably. And then there will be a thousand things that happen in between where I'm like, oh, I wasn't expecting this to come up or this doesn't work the way I wanted it to. So, you know, never go in expecting things to work out because they're never going to work out probably the way you think they are. Um, so besides tasks and stuff, I'm always working on block mesh sketches and stuff, just being a level designer. That's kind of the main bread and butter of like what I do. Um, and, you know, some days I don't have any meetings at all. I just work on you know, layouts. Um, and other days, sometimes I have maybe one or two meetings, uh, it just depends on where we are in the project and where we are and uh, how far the level is. Um, so, you know, usually every other day I had to check in with my lead just to see where things are at, just make sure my tasks are going well. Um, and then other times I have like a couple meetings, uh, meeting with the art leads, if we pass the level off to art, um, and just have a, a check-in on where things are there. And so outside of those three things, there's tons of things in between that come up and happen all the time. So just as an example on Ragnarok, I worked on, uh, we have these water geysers that you can freeze with the ax. Um, and I worked on an elevator puzzle that had a bunch of moving parts. Um, and it was super complex. I think I worked on that puzzle pretty much from when I started to when I left. It was a two-year puzzle thing, even though the puzzle only lasted, I don't know, if you run through it and you know what you're doing, probably one minute, but there's so many outlier situations that can happen because you can freeze the geysers in different orders. Uh, you can get Brock to go to different locations and certain things will happen. We have to support that with dialogue and make sure the player understands that. And so while I'm working through those, maybe I have a task that says, oh, uh, I need to implement the elevator here. Um, and I need to make sure it works and it's animated. Um, so we do, uh, level designers do a lot of like stub in animations where we just use kind of Maya to, uh, I think it's just the basic timeline animation editor or just moving simple shapes up and down just for, you know, what level designers need to do. No, like polish or anything like that, but, um, I'll be working on an animation with the elevator. Um, I'll put it in, you know, I'll make sure it works and then I'll go and test it. And then I realize, oh, the box for the elevator doesn't have player collision. So I'll need to go back, you know, add those flags uh, to the box, rerun it again, go and test. It works, but when I throw the ax and the geyser freezes, the elevator doesn't move. And I'm like, well, I set up the elevator to be animated. Why isn't it animated? Can you go back, check? And we're like, oh, there's, you know, some pins that I didn't connect for this or maybe the elevator. We borrow a lot of things from other sections of the game. We reuse a lot of uh, already tools that have already been implemented. And a lot of times other people will be pushing changes to those modules globally and it'll break all of my stuff when I have it. And I don't know what happens until I go in there and test it. So that's how like things will pop up, uh, things will change. Um, and it's all about how you can problem solve these things as they come up that will make you an efficient and really good level designer. Um, so another thing that I tell everybody is super, super, super important. And I talk about this all the time is communication. 
And this is something I definitely struggled with going to Naughty Dog because I wasn't expecting, you know, that type of workflow and the amount of responsibility there. Communication is hands down the most important thing uh, when it comes to game design. It, you could be the most talented um, artist, level designer, animator. Your portfolio could look beyond incredible, like anything that you could put in a portfolio. But if you can't, properly communicate with people, you know, you can't talk to people on your team, you know, make sure everybody's up to date on where things are at. I, I'm just going to say you will fail as a level designer, environment artist, anything. Um, mostly because uh, you talk with people every day, you're meeting new people every day. And when it comes to, you know, completing tasks, especially for level design, uh, since I'm in charge of, you know, teams of animators, scripters, tech design, uh, everything that I do affects all of the other teams. So whenever it's ready to pass something off to art, you know, if I don't let art know that it's done and they have to start working on it, you know, that's another day for them. And then as soon as that gets delayed, maybe that artist is working on another level also. And they're like, Hey, uh, you should have told me this yesterday because now I'm working over in Midgard today. I can't work on the Svartalfheim stuff, and then that gets delayed even more. Uh, so communication is the most important thing to get what you're working on done in time for your deadlines. Now, deadlines in game design are pretty um, iffy. It's not like a college class like project where it's like, hey, this project's due today. You know, just make sure you have everything done. A lot of times in game design, especially in Last of Us, I think we delayed that like, I don't know, two or three times, like mostly. <clears throat> and I remember they came out with the, um, the first delay. Um, we're like, hey, we're pushing the game back to this date. And then they announced the release date or something. And then like a week later, they're like, ah, oh, we can't do that because we just realized that there's so much more stuff to do and we delayed it again. So that's very common um, when it comes to game design, uh, pretty much any game production pipeline. Um, and it's very hard to kind of get away from that because you realize once you're in the meat of everything that there's so many moving pieces that it's almost impossible to understand uh, a timeline for things. So a lot of times, you know, I'll get handed a project uh, or a level and we're like, oh, we think this is probably going to be done in about a month. And most of the times it takes longer. Everything takes longer because uh, there's always things that you're never expecting to come up uh, that you need to solve and you never know how long those are going to take. Uh, so that's why I always say communication helps make those delays, not, you know, as frequent, um, and helps things move a lot smoother. And they'll definitely anybody you're working with, if you have good communication, they will continue to work with you well, and they will, you know, you'll most likely probably get promotions or move up solely based on your communication when working with other people. So that's why I always, I always talk about that a lot. Um, so moving on from that, um, knowing and mastering uh, the software, this is very important. Um, so I use Maya um, almost every day, pretty much. And you know, you can use 3ds Max. A lot of a lot of studios will have options for you based on what you're you're comfortable with. Now, if a studio mostly says, "Hey, you know, we use Unreal Engine," you can't probably be like, "Well, I kind of want to use Unity." That's probably not going to you know work there because you know you can't switch things uh, between engines most of the time uh so but when it comes to software usually if you request you know any industry leading software like my or 3ds max they'll they'll have those options for you um but most of the time uh at least at naughty dog and santa monica studio i've used maya as my main level editor which is actually kind of different from a lot of other studios you know a lot of studios use in-game unreal engine editors for level design um but I've actually found that it's a lot easier uh, for me to get my ideas out in a 3D space when I'm sketching in Maya. I feel like Maya has, you know, a lot more freedom when it comes to the geometry that I can create. Um, you know, and in Unreal, it's very blocky, you know, working with those BSPs and stuff. I, it's never really been a workflow for me. Um, so I'd recommend trying both of those and kind of just seeing what you're comfortable with. And uh, a lot of times the the studio will have that software for you for what whatever workflow you're comfortable with because they don't care how you get the job done they just care you know 
if it gets done on time and it gets done well. So usually they'll, they'll have those things for you. Um, and then going on from there, um, being a game designer isn't about just doing it for a paycheck. I know that's, that's definitely an important part of the job, you know, make sure, making sure you get paid. But showing up and doing the bare minimum will never get you far uh, in the industry, in any department that you're in. You know, for me, it's sitting down. Here's my task that's create this, this puzzle area or create this, this path that helps you know, support these types of story beats. I'll sit down and be like, how can I make this the best possible experience I can? And so I'll make a, a sketch, an iteration of that space. And sometimes I'll look at it, I'll run around it and I'll be like, you know, I don't think this is working out the way I want it to. And sometimes before I even talk to my leads, I'll go back and I'll just, I'll just restart. I'll make a new, I'll make a new space. Cause I'm like, you know, I don't want to rely on my first instinct and I want to, you know, usually I create a handful of first sketches and I'll come, you know, look all at all of them um, after it's all done. I'm like, all right, well, what's the best aspects of, of this space? You know, do, can I combine these to make the best experience? And it's all about, you know, doing as much as you can to make the, the player experience the best it can be. Um, and another thing, I guess, uh, outside of just software and wanting to, you know, create the best levels, um, having knowledge in all aspects of game design will help you go incredibly far. So me as a level designer, uh, going back to my, my work on the Black Ops 3 maps um, and kind of me talking about how that pushed me to understand how to do lighting, how to do a little bit of scripting, how to do animation. Uh, I hate scripting. I can't stand it. And it's my least favorite thing about game design. Words, especially in syntax, my brain just doesn't work that way. I'm a very visual person, um, visual learner. Um, but being able to understand scripting a little bit uh, will help you uh, do any type of level design or any type of other department work. Because when you're making uh, your spaces, you'll understand the limits of everybody else's work at the same time. And an example for that is um, like, let's say I'm making a really large open space in God of War, like the lake, right? We have to understand the limitations of the engine also, just how much can we fit into one space without the game crashing? A lot of times, or actually all of the time, we were fighting with how much memory the PS5 had even. And a lot of times it would be the whole lake couldn't even be loaded at a certain time. And actually the way we built the lake was, especially in the, in, in the new one, it was a little bit different. Around the whole lake, we kind of had a clock of zones where every time you would sled into a new zone, we would unload certain things that were kind of off in the distance that you couldn't see anymore. So we could get space for wherever you were in that, that part of the lake. And so there's a lot of like behind the scenes of, you know, is this space too big? Can we even show this stuff off in the distance? Can we start loading the next uh, level so that there's no load times or load halls for any of that? And so when you express that you understand the limitations of other people's work, people will be much more appreciative when you hand their work off to them and it's already set up uh, you know, to work well for their job. And they're not going to have to come back to you and be like, hey, you know, we can't do this, you know, because it's too big. Or uh, whenever I built that elevator puzzle, uh, when I have a tech designer who would rig uh, the elevator and I had to build it in a specific way that actually made sense for them because they have to, you know, it has to be realistic, at least in that game, it has to be grounded. So that makes their job easier and it makes your job easier also because then you won't have to do as many iterations. So understanding everybody else's job a little bit will help you do your job a lot better. Um, and then of course, like I'm sure all of you play video games, but just being up to date on where games are at, what games are you know coming out that change how we look at games. Um, I use Elden Ring as an example of how I think that that took level design to a whole new level. And I've done some interviews over the past three months after I've done with Santa Monica Studio, and I used Elden Ring as an example of where I think level design is going um, in the industry. You know, For <clears throat> those who are familiar with the Souls series, uh, 
you know, the Souls games are a very linear uh, game. They're in, in a sense, uh, you can kind of go where you want, but it's a very kind of locked down path. And Elden Ring is a very open world space. And they took all of those mechanics and made that work in an open world space when traditionally those games were linear. Uh, so being up to date on what games are doing that helps change game design will let people you're interviewing with know that you understand uh, what's possible and what you think that you can do to change the game afterwards. So <clears throat> um, another section that, um, like I talked about earlier, the Saints Row guys came to talk to us. Uh, they had a lot of stuff to say about this. So I definitely wanted to make a section uh, talking about things that you can do that will make you more desirable to studios and uh, people who are interviewing you. Um, so it looks like I've already touched on some of this stuff already, but you know, being familiar with other departments work, you know, me being a level designer, and if you take a look at my portfolio, I'm also an environment artist. Um, those kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so being a level designer and an environment artist lets me create spaces that are fun, but also make sense in a real world environment. Like I understand architecture, I understand how things should be built. I understand, you know, what makes sense in a natural environment versus a fantasy environment. And that kind of takes away me making fun levels and then going, well, this level doesn't really make sense. Like how would the environment artists do this? I'm already thinking about those things while I'm making the level. And the same thing goes for like scripting and like animation and rigging. Like if you're a super heavy scripter um, and you're working with, you know, tools or uh, tech that has to do with anything that has to do with animation, those kind of go hand in hand also. Like you can make tools that are more uh, open to uh, animators to allow them to do their work even better. So uh, just goes back to saying being familiar with all departments will help you definitely get ahead faster uh, wherever you're going. Um, another thing is, and this might seem obvious to some, um, but I've talked to some people who, you know, they don't necessarily think about this is that when you're applying to a studio, um, just understand their history. Like, where did they come from? Like, what games did they make that allows them to make the games they're making today? And understand the, <clears throat> the process and the evolution they t that went on during that. Um, and just understanding, you know, who works there, who's worked on what. Um, will help you just be that much more concrete when you're talking to them and understanding what games they want to make. Um, another one is uh, just being able to have a super open mind. I'll use an example from when I was in college. We had a, a senior studio class. Um, pretty much at the end of the year, senior, senior year, we, we all had to make a game together as a class, which was insane. It was crazy. You know, having everybody work together to make a project who aren't being paid uh, was a crazy experience. And we had leads working on different characters and we had one person who was working on some specific level or some type of character. And it just wasn't going in the direction that we as a group decided it was, should go. Um, and they didn't want to change anything. They were like, no, I'm just going to make this how I want it to go. I don't need any help. Um, and we tried to give them feedback. We tried to, you know, work with them to try to, you know, come to a, an agreement on how things should be. And they just didn't want to do anything. Anytime that you're not open to hearing other people's ideas, people will be completely turned off by that. Every time you're working in a studio, um, everybody knows that you're there to make the best product available to the consumer. Uh, so there's been plenty of times where I've made levels where I'm like, okay, like this is pretty good. Like the flow is pretty good. It's fun. And then I'll show it to a coworker and he's like, he's like this section, I don't think worked at all. And for me, I can't take that as, oh, he just hates the stuff that I do. You know, he's just trying to give me feedback on how to make this better. And there'll be a conversation based on that. You know, we'll go back and forth based on ideas. You know, I feel that this works. Um, and these are, are the parts that I think are very strong about this section. And he'll have other ideas. Now I can take those and, you know, use those or I can replace them, but having conversations and being able to take feedback and, you know, criticism very well is very important. 
Um, and that's hard as, as artists and designers, because when you're making something, you know, you have an emotional attachment to that. Cause you're like, this is cool. Like this is, this is me putting my ideas out on paper. And when somebody comes along and says, your ideas are, you know, crap, sometimes you're just like, well, you know, I kind of put my heart and soul into this, like what's wrong. And there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes there's, you know, other people think about situations in different ways. So, you know, I always see people giving me critique and feedback as just opening myself up to having a better level. So always keep that in mind going forward. Just know people in the industry are only trying to help you make a better product. Um, and I guess I've already touched on this too, having a concentration and a secondary skill. <clears throat> my concentration is level design. Uh, but my secondary skill is environment art. Those go hand in hand. So a lot of times when I've been in interviews, uh, people have specifically said to me, you know, being able to do level design and environment art is rare because that those are two, comp well, they're not separate, but they're different skill sets, but they go well together. That will make you way more attractive for a studio than just having one and just being familiar, more familiar with two uh, will definitely put you ahead of a lot of other people. Um, and then I guess when it comes to a portfolio, uh, just make sure it isn't too crowded and it fits within the style of the studio you're applying to. Um, the more I think about it, when I, when I started at Naughty Dog, you know, I didn't, the only experience I really had was at Pixel Press. I didn't have any AAA experience and they usually don't hire people without AAA experience. And, you know, you hear these questions a lot of like, how do I get into the industry if I don't have AAA experience? Like, what's, like, how do I do this? And a lot of things that I did to get into Naughty Dog was my portfolio, if you look at it, is a lot of these dark, you know, city structure, like destroyed, decrepit, um, you know, types of levels. And that's kind of the style of the last of us, or at least the style that they were wanting to go towards. So not only did I have level design and environment art in my portfolio, I had the style they were looking for. You know, I didn't have any really stylized stuff. I had a lot of realistic pieces, which is, you know, what their game looks like. So that will also be another thing that puts you ahead. If you're, if you're wanting to apply to a certain studio, you know, you don't have to do this, but if you want to organize your specific portfolio specifically for that studio to reflect that, hey, a lot of my work makes sense for the titles you're working on. Um, that will make you stand out a little bit more, um, you know, when it comes to who they're picking to go on to the next steps of the interview. Um, and I, I throw this section in, you know, usually you know, I don't have to mention these things all the time, but th these are simple things that probably everybody knows, but, you know, to remind yourself of, you know, going forward that will just make your job a lot easier because I've ran into tons of problems not having these things. And these are very important outside of, you know, communication and being skilled um, is just time management because being a level designer or at least any other job, because like I talked about earlier, you know, that week I have a specific set of tasks and it's up to me to figure out how to get things done in a certain amount of time. And I was always that kid in college, I'm not going to lie, that I pushed my projects off to the day, the night before it was due. And I would just stay up all night, you know, get my thing done. I knew I was very good at what I did. So I was like, I can pass my classes with a B because I can just wait, do it in 10 hours the night before, not sleep, and then just turn it in and go home. And while you could probably keep that up for a little bit, it will catch up with you. I was like, I was like, no, I can, I can do this, you know, forever. It will catch up for you, uh, up to you. And there were times where I was like, oh, I don't need to work on this right now. I could probably put this off till next week and work on this thing, you know, first when really I should have worked on the thing that had uh, the most unknowns about it. Because once I got to that thing the week afterwards, there were a bunch of things that came up that I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting this to be like this. You know, I have some issues that I need to talk to other departments about, but other departments are busy now. And now it's on me that the thing got delayed a little bit or the level needs more work. And the last thing you want to do is to ask an environment artist or a tech designer or anybody else to stay and work later than their actual hours. They will resent you for that. And so it's up to you to make sure that you get your job done in a timely manner that everybody else can also, you know, work in a healthy way. 
as well. Um, so also just being healthy, you know, and constantly in game studios being like, Hey, make sure you drink water. Like make sure you do this. I still struggle with this. I have a soda every day. I have, you know, I'm definitely not the healthiest person out there, but being healthy and having a good structure to your schedule will help you do your job that much better. And going back to talking about, you know, it's not just a job that you get paid for. It's a passion project that you're working on. So you want to make sure that most of the time you're, you know, you're putting yourself in a position for your, to do your very best and to produce your best work, because ultimately you're probably not going to be at that studio forever. Um, and you want to make the most of your time and, you know, come out on the other end saying, you know, I'm proud of the projects and levels and spaces I worked on here. And I'm proud to say that, you know, I did everything that I could to make this the best product that I could. Um, another thing is understanding your limits. Uh, like I was talking about before, Naughty Dog, sometimes I work 100 hours a week. And that definitely wasn't healthy. And understand going forward that you can put everything that you can into your project and making sure you're working the best way that you can. Um, but remember to have a balance in your life. And also uh, something that was different when I moved to Santa Monica studio, my managers there were always checking in with me and be like, Hey, are you working too much? Like we want to make sure that you have a healthy amount of work um, and don't feel bad expressing those uh, types of feelings to anybody you work with ever, you know, just make sure that you're not pushing yourself over the limit because one or two really good days where you're getting a lot of work done, maybe work, I don't know, 20 hours within those two days. And then you're burned out for the rest of the week and you can't do a lot of stuff for the rest of the week. So consistency and working less is better than crunching for two days and then having nothing later. Um, and then just careful planning, you know, like this goes back to the time management and your tasks and stuff. Just make sure you understand and have a structure for what you're working on. Um, and it'll just make your job and life completely easier. And these are things that I definitely learned going through Naughty Dog um, in Santa Monica Studio. And I don't feel like you can fully understand that until you're there and you're working in that environment. But just things to think about and remember going forward whenever you do start working in those places. Um, and I know I already touched on some of these things real quick. When it comes to applying, um, you're probably not going to start at a studio that isn't your first pick. Um, and as hilarious as this is, Naughty Dog wasn't the first place that I wanted to go to. It was surprisingly, it was like the second or third place, which is crazy that that was the, the return rate. But it goes back to like the things that I talked about earlier. My portfolio was strictly made for those games. I had two skills that were very highly valued at that time. Um, you know, I was great at communicating. A lot of things will put you to, or a lot of those things will put you at an easier place to get to those places. But just understand that you might have to work at some smaller places or even an internship first to kind of get your experience. Uh, me working at Pixel Press was probably the most perfect opportunity for me to get that initial professional experience. They weren't the games that I, you know, was my goal to work on, but I you know it was a, it was a great way for me to kind of start that process. So just understand that, you know, let's say your dream studio is Bethesda or Blizzard or, or Naughty Dog or anything like that. Just know that sometimes it's out of your hands. Um, sometimes people aren't looking for your specific role. Sometimes they're, when I was done at Santa Monica studio, I was looking for other level designer positions and, you know, I was like, I've worked at, you know, these two big studios. I know I should be able to kind of go where I want now. And some places just aren't looking for level designers. And so you're just like, well, I might just have to wait on that and, you know, look somewhere else and kind of just keep checking in on this one. Uh, so that'll happen at all points in your career. Um, another, th uh, another suggestion I have is don't just submit just a regular application. Uh, I've done this many times where, you know, you just find a job listing and you, you just throw your resume on there. Maybe there's a cover letter or something and you kind of just submit it and you kind of forget about it and maybe you don't hear anything back. Happens all the time, happens to everybody. Um, a lot of suggestions I would have for this is like, you can apply. If there is a cover letter, every time I saw a cover letter, I was like, I don't want to write a cover letter. Like, what am I, what am I supposed to say? And it's like, obviously I just need a job and I want to work in games, but a cover letter is a perfect way to ex you know, express how much you want the job. So just you know, talk about how much you like the games, 
even if it maybe isn't your favorite, talk about what you like about the games, you know, what, what you think you could do to improve about it. Um, and then probably within a week after you submitted, reach out to a recruiter there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and a lot of times, some of you have actually reached out to me over the past week, and I haven't apl uh, applied to any of you yet. I've been moving. There's tons of other things going on. Just know that uh, just to be patient uh, when it comes to that. You can reach out to recruiters, you know, give them some time to respond. Wait maybe two to three days. Don't kind of you know, just say, like, hey, you know, I messaged you yesterday. Like, what's up? Give them some time. You can keep responding. If a couple, after a couple times they don't respond to you, move on to the next one. Like, uh, just make sure that you make them aware that not only are you willing to apply, but that you're, you're reaching out to them. You're really interested and you, you think that you can be a valuable asset to them. Uh, just try to get your name and presence known to them in many ways that you can. Um, so yeah, uh, going on the next, reach out to people in the industry like me. Uh, some of you have already. That's great. Uh, share your, uh, share your portfolio. Uh, and if people don't respond, you know, that's common. Uh, you can message as many people as you want. Uh, just don't try to be, uh, you know, don't be on them every day because that will, that will make them not want to respond to you, but just make your presence known to them. You know, make sure that they understand that what you have to offer is valuable. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mentioned this also lots of studios, especially, um, after the pandemic hit, uh, I have tons of like remote internship opportunities, which is awesome. Uh, there's plenty of studios with those. Um, just even a studio that you're not even interested in, look for an internship opportunity there because that'll be your easiest way just to get your foot in the door um, there, especially if you treat your internship application like a regular job application, like your portfolio matches their, their style of games. That'll just give you that much of a, a better opportunity to get into that. Um, so outside of applications, my best suggestions uh, moving forward is just to connect with as many people as possible, um, like LinkedIn or beyond. I, I don't like going on Twitter, but there's a lot of people who, you know, a lot of game devs who share a lot of stuff on Twitter, be a part of communities um, and, you know, just try to make your presence known in a positive way uh, when you're trying to, you know, be social uh, with those people. Um, a lot of times in college, uh, I YouTubed like almost 80% of probably what I know today. Um, a lot of times my professors would give me a project, you know, we'd listen to stuff in class and then I get home and I forget every single thing that he talked about. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Like, I don't know how, how to set up this animation of Maya. YouTube has millions of tutorials for almost anything you could possibly think of uh, when it comes to, you know, 3D production, anything, especially with how popular uh, these types of roles are getting. People are just creating free classes on, on YouTube. You know, you can just search anything up. So definitely use and utilize those whenever, whenever possible. If you're stuck on something, Google it, just find a YouTube video. There's probably something that exists for that. Um, yeah. Uh, and if you haven't, definitely start making a portfolio now. Uh, the earlier you can get a portfolio started, the better. Um, I've had my portfolio has, you know, been an evolving thing over time. When as soon as I make new pieces, sometimes I'll reanalyze my portfolio and be like, you know, this piece I made quite a long time ago, this probably doesn't fit with this anymore. So I'll take it out. So it constantly changes. Just be up to date on, you know, making a portfolio. I'd recommend making a website personally, Wix. That's where I've created all of mine. Just super simple, easy to use, uh, no scripting. You know, it's a very visual tool. Um, and they, people won't care if you made it on Wix. So they're like, oh, you didn't make this from scratch. Nobody cares about that. Um, sometimes I've had an art station. People looked at the art station. I think a, a website definitely helps tailor you better to wherever you're applying to. Uh, so that's my best suggestion for that. Um, and establishing a social presence in gaming communities. Uh, in the Black Ops 3 maps that I was making, uh, modding communities, uh, be involved with those. Uh, when I was making those maps, there was a discord server with a whole bunch of people that were making maps, uh, and being involved in there. And there were Treyarch devs in that discord server. And so whenever I would post update pictures of the maps I was working on, it gave visibility for people who were at that studio to see images of the things I was working on. 
Um, and I, you know, developed a relationship with a, a level designer there um, after he saw my stuff. And, you know, we started talking and that kind of got my foot in the door a little bit there. And I, I didn't start working there. And it's been a gold mine of work there, but that kind of led me to talk to other people in the industry because I'd already had this connection. And then I could ask him to be like, hey, you know, we've had this good relationship over the years. You've seen my stuff. Would it, would it be all right if you passed my my application on to whoever's looking at it. And he happily did that for me. And sometimes those opportunities, you know, I would have never had that chance to get my foot in the door that way. I didn't have to submit regularly. I used that path to get in and kind of around the regular application process. So, you know, take every advantage and opportunity you can when it comes to being involved with modern communities. Cause sometimes, and most of the times, people who work in the modern communities, you know, if they're seen enough, they just, the, the studios just hire them because they know their tools well and they know they make good stuff. So that will definitely only benefit you if you're involved or at least, you know, searching for those. Um, obviously, work on personal projects. I don't think I have a single project I worked on college in my portfolio just because most of them are tutorial projects to help me learn the software. And I wasn't like, this doesn't represent me as a person and what I want to make. So definitely make sure you're working on stuff that you want to work on. And sometimes that will help you develop and work on things a lot more. There was a lot of projects in college where I was like, I don't want to do this. And I kind of half-assed it and just didn't put a lot of effort into it. Animation projects, the toy truck one, I was like, I don't want to make toy trucks. Like I want to make cool, like, you know, creepy stuff. I want to make awesome levels like that. So working on projects on the side that uh, you're more interested in will definitely help you uh, create a better portfolio because sometimes it won't feel like work and it'll make it easier for you to make projects that you want to actually show to people. Uh, so just keep that in mind going forward. Um, and a lot of things I'll say this, you know, it might not be the healthiest thing, but work harder than anyone else around you. I was the only person out of my class when I graduated that went to get a job. I think every, almost everybody, except for one person who just started uh, last year in the gaming industry, everybody I graduated with didn't do anything. And what's crazy is when I started out freshman year, there was like, I don't know, two to 300 people. And somebody got up on that, on the stand the first couple of weeks I was there and they're like, look to your person to your left, look to your person to your right. Like more than half of you aren't going to be here next year. And I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, that's crazy. And sure enough, the next year I came back, half the people were there. And by the time senior year rolled around, there was, I don't know, maybe like 40 max. And then 26 of us, 17 around that number probably graduated. And then not a lot of people went into the industry because it's a very difficult industry to be in. And the reason it's difficult is because it's built on passion. It's not just a job that you, you know, go and work. You have to love what you do. So when I say work harder than anyone else, just make pieces that you feel best represent you. And that will put you above everybody else's things that you like working on, things that don't feel like work. There will be things along the way. Like for me, it was the scripting in Black Ops, the maps. I hated that, but I knew that if I at least got past that section, I was going to be able to help make a portfolio piece that I really wanted to show people. And that will just help you immensely going forward, uh, applying to places that you want to go to. Um, and I guess my last suggestion is just be patient, but don't, you know, when I say be patient, it's, it's very easy to get frustrated. Um, especially when people aren't responding to you. Like earlier, I heard somebody say that their interview got canceled. I've, uh, when I was done with God of War Ragnarok, I think I've done I don't know, six or seven different interviews. And, you know, even working at those two highly acclaimed studios, six of those places said, no, we're not going to continue forward with you. And I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, like I've worked at these places. And even if I hadn't worked at these places, I can understand the frustration of being like, come on, like somebody's got to let me do something. Um, and just not too long ago, like within the last month, I got my job at Rainbow. Um, so just be patient, but, you know, go to as many places as you can, apply to as many places as you can. You will get something eventually if your work represents how passionate you are. And that will ultimately 
get the, the job that you eventually want. So, but yeah, I guess that's the end of my presentation. I know I don't know what time it is or if I went a little bit longer if we have time for questions, but yeah. any questions about anything, not just specifically level design, I'm very familiar with all departments or you know, anything that I probably hadn't touched on yet, just, yeah, just go ahead. So. Yeah. We're good on time. So uh, I'll ask the first cool. question. And by the way, this was hugely, hugely helpful. Like I wish I could have had this presentation when I was in college to watch. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds like the, the Saints Row thing. When they came and talked to us, you know, I was like, this is perfect. Like I want to talk to devs. Like I want to hear what life is like now, like yeah. while I'm in school. So yeah, this has been great. Um, this question goes back to something you mentioned earlier. Um, you moved to L.A., um, to work your first job with, I think, either Naughty Dog or um, Santa Monica. But did you get the job before you moved or did you move to LA to search for jobs and just commit to working in the video game industry? Um, so I I had the guarantee that I had the job before I moved out here. Okay. Um, so things are a little bit different nowadays, right? Um, back when I started, um, you know, pre-pandemic, most of the time there were no remote jobs, right? You had to go where the studios are. So mm -hmm. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to just apply to all the places out there. And now there's, you know, there's other States, like I, I, there's studios in Maryland, there's studios on the East coast. Most of them are out here on the West coast in Los Angeles. There's places in Texas. There's, there's studios in a lot of places, but the majority of them, at least the huge triple A ones, I knew a lot of them were out here in Los Angeles. So I just started applying to a lot of places out here. My actually, my goal was to work at Treyarch, and I knew they were out here. So I was like, if I can't work at Treyarch, I might as well apply to places who are around here. So I'm, if I do get a job out here, I'll be around the people who work at that studio, and that'll probably give me, you know, a better opportunity to connect with people uh, here. Because the industry, as big as the, as much you know, as much success as the industry is, I think it's a multi the multi multi billion dollar industry now but the people who the people who work in the industry the industry is very small you know the studios there's not that many people and so when you go to places like e3 and you're a dev or you go out here places like out here like i i you know go out here and go to restaurants sometimes and i see people with you know treyarch shirts and i'm like that guy probably works at treyarch like there's tons of game devs out here and everybody loves wearing their company shirt because they want people to know. So I just thought that was going to be my best chance to get as much exposure to all these other studios that I could possibly have. Um, so, but now, um, you know, that's not as much of an issue, especially with remote work, like uh, Rainbow Studios is based in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't want to move out there because I like living in Los Angeles. Um, and a lot of places are offering remote positions. So you don't have to move out to Los Angeles to work at a studio in Los Angeles. Now there's some restriction states sometimes, um, uh, and you know, usually overseas or anything in a, you know, other countries, like that's fine. Like they'll, they'll work with you if that's offered. Um, but yeah, there's tons of tons of opportunity for remote work. So I don't know, I'm staying here and, you know, working in somewhere else that's nowhere near me. So. Awesome. It sounds like a good setup. Yeah. Cool. All right. Anybody from the audience have questions? If you want, um, you can just start shouting it out or you can raise your hand on Zoom and I'll call on you. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I was wondering uh, when you first got your job at Naughty Dog, mm -hmm. when you first started, did you have the feeling of like, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing? And if you <laughs> did, like... Yeah. How long did it take for you to, to not be, feel that way? Yeah. So, um, definitely like I, well, not at first. So when I was working at pixel press, I knew I was like, you know, I really like that job there, but I knew I was going to go do AAA. Like I was like, I'm going to go do AAA. That's what I'm going to school for. That's what I want to make. And I've, I've known that forever. So I was like, of course, I'm going to apply there. And of course, I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to get that job. Um, the interviews were, you know, they're terrifying. I'm kind of an introverted person, even doing this talk, like I'm nervous for, for stuff like this. And um, doing and going out and doing the interviews, getting that job, for me, 
uh, and I know this probably isn't for everybody. For me, during the interviews, I was completely comfortable during those interviews for Naughty Dog, which is weird because it's a terrifying process. I had, uh, especially going to studios like those, the interview process is like six hours. Like it's crazy. You do uh, an initial interview to talk to the recruiter, just to, you know, kind of get an idea of why you're applying there, what, you know, make sure that, you know, you're a suitable candidate to even talk to. Um, then you have a, an interview with like the leads for an hour to talk about just other stuff, design questions. Then you do a design test that they give you like a week or two to do. And then you have an interview about the design test. You know, they ask you questions on the spot, like, you know, oh, we don't like this section. How would you change it here? And then you have to make sure you have those appropriate responses. Um, and then you have probably three or four other interviews with other departments of people you're going to be working with. And throughout that entire process, I was comfortable because I was like, I have no reason to be nervous because this is what I want to do. Like this, I know this is what I want to do and I'm excited to be a part of the process anyways. And, you know, they flew me out to do an in-person interview. And then after that, you know, they'd offer me the job and I got there, you know, the first day, you know, I sat down in the chair and I was like, you know, walking around the studio. I'm like, this is crazy. Like I've seen the studio and YouTube videos. Like I'm actually here walking around you know, like Neil Druckmann's like walking past and so like he scares the shit out of me. Like, I don't never want to talk to him, but like, I, you know, I was walking around. I was like, this is cool. Like I'm here. Like, this is what I want to do. And then there was like the onboarding process for like a week or two where they were like, kind of getting me familiar with things. And I was like, oh, okay. Like you use Maya. Like I've used Maya. That's cool. Like I, I know the stuff you work with. And then as soon as I started working on levels, like I remember the first meeting I had where like, all right, well, you're going to be on a section of Santa Barbara. Here's, here's the narrative pitch and go have fun. And I was like, that's it. Like, like, you're just going to trust me to some, like, I felt, I still felt like a kid at that point where I was like, you're just going to trust me with your crazy multi-million dollar game with a section of it. Like, and I went to go sit down and start working on it. And then, then it hit me. Like I started like panicking for probably three months, a little bit. And I was like, like, how do these people trust me to <laughs> work on these sections of the game? That's such a huge franchise. And it took me, yeah, you know, like I said, about three months to get past that initial like freaking out section. And I guarantee probably any of you would probably have something like that. And then eventually um, after those three months, you know, I kind of started to voice that to, I, you, when you start, you usually have a higher up, a senior level person, kind of like myself, uh, that will work with a junior level developer, uh, like hand in hand while they're working on levels, just in case, like they're kind of your mentors uh, while you're there to kind of help you uh, get your job done and do the best you can. And I started to voice that to him after a while. I was like, like, dude, I'm like, I'm freaking out. Like, like, how do I, how do I do this sometimes? Like I'm, I'm afraid of making the wrong choices sometimes. Like, like I'm afraid of going in and, you know, having these discussions where I have to pitch ideas and like, I have to talk to these, you know, the leads who've been in the industry for 15, 20 years. And I have to convince them that my ideas are good enough to be a part of their game. And, you know, he sat down and he told me, he's like, well, you shouldn't be nervous because throughout that entire rigorous interview process, right? They're making sure that you are a good candidate for whatever you're working on. So if, you, if you're there working at the studio, you know that uh, whoever's interviewed you has, knows you're talented, knows that you know how to get the work done. And if you don't, you'll find a way to do it. So that was kind of confirmation for me is like, I'm here. And that's the reason why I shouldn't be nervous because I'm here for a reason pretty much. And I know that the people who hired me saw that as well. And then that kind of started to slowly go away. Now, I, I'll, I won't lie, like multiple times during production when like that, those feelings will come back a little bit when I see like the release trailer, like go out, or I'll see like the announcement trailer for the game come out. When I was working on God of War Ragnarok, you know, I'd already shipped Last of Us Part Two, So I was very familiar with the process. And I moved over there, different team, same feeling. Uh, I was completely okay. Cause I was like, it's just more game dev, you know, more Sony, more AAA flagship titles. And when that announcement trailer came out and I saw it like just on the TV, I didn't search it up. I saw it like just happen while I was watching TV one time. And I was like, oh shit. Like I forgot this is a huge, <laughs> a huge project. Um, but that is, it's, it gets easier 
as time goes on. And you start to, once you start to have more things in your portfolio, professional portfolio, you feel like, okay, I have these titles under my belt now. Not only am I at this studio for a reason, but I've accomplished these goals in the past. And so it just makes everything easier the more you go forward. But you definitely, definitely have those feelings when you first start off, or at least for me. So. Awesome. Thanks, Connor. Anybody else from the audience have a question? Question, thought, comment, joke? Still early for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any, anything you guys are wondering about? Any, have a any department? Sure. Uh, so I, I tried the Black Ops 3 modding tools when it came out. But this is before I went into like actual school for this. So I was like, this is mm -hmm. super overwhelming. But after like listening to you, I, I really do want to go back and try that again. Yeah. I think, well, now that I know Unity, I know it's not the same as Unity and Unreal, but like mm -hmm. it gives me the confidence to try that again. I appreciate yeah. that you talk about that. Of course, yeah, and you're you're definitely not alone in feeling like that. Now, the Black Ops, the Radiant Engine specifically, I've interviewed at Infinity Ward, talked to people from Sledgehammer, and I had an interview at Treyarch. Right? And none of those uh, went through. I got pretty far in the process, but you know, it didn't go the way I wanted to. But I talked to them about their own engine, and I tell them I've been using Radiant, and they're like, "Oh, so you've been through hell." Like they know their engine is not specifically geared towards, you know, being user friendly or anything like that. Radiant has probably the steepest learning curve of any engine I've ever used. It's crazy. And the only way I was able to actually get through it is because I was just so excited to work on zombie maps because I was like, I've been sketching little zombie maps like on graph paper when I was in grade school. And I was like, when I had the tools, it you know as overwhelming as it was i was like i know this is the tool that's going to get me my personal projects that i want so as frustrating as i was every day like there'd be times where like the, i remember the first time i opened the editor and i was like kind of familiar with how things were but there's like all these different like what is what are these like graph modules that have to do with fx like i have no idea what that means and like how do you even how do you script a door to work and especially with radiant it's not as mainstream, so it's not anywhere near as mainstream as Unreal. So there's no, there's no people out there making tutorials. There's a very small community of people who are actually involved with that and who will actually like share information about that engine. But I think Radiant was perfect for me and it's perfect for, I mean, if, if you say you're going to go back and get involved with that, it's a, it's a very great tool to become disciplined in figuring stuff out because I would have times when I would start building the map and I was starting to get familiar with how things were that that map that I showed on here, I don't know if I can go back to this, the, this map here, uh, the one I'm showing oh, is probably, I oh, disabled yeah. the screen share so we could see each other's faces. So, if oh, you were oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'll, good. I'll turn this off again after I'm done with this. Um, but yeah, like this map here is probably like my 20th map like that I had made in the tools. I had, I've never even shown anybody the other 19 maps that helped me get to this one. And so I probably had like, I think Steam, Steam logs your hours on how many, like how much time you spend. I think I spent like 3000 hours in, in this engine alone. And probably a thousand of it went specifically towards this map. But the other 2,000 hours was me just messing around with shit and having shit break. And sometimes I would be like making a map and then I would like wake up the next morning, try to launch it and it would crash. And it would give me this weird error that I had no idea what it meant. And I tried looking out for it online. Of course, it's not popular. And I was like, how, how, how do I even figure out like how to fix this? And so when you really don't have anywhere to turn for answers, the only thing left you can do is just mess around with it and try things out so what i would do is i would literally create another fresh map file take all of my geometry 
and everything and import it into that. So I didn't have any of the scripting because I would probably mess around with something that was like script heavy in that. And I probably broke something. And since I'm not a heavy scripter, I wouldn't know how to fix it. And so I just started fresh again with my geometry and then went through, I was like, okay, let me go back through, re-script everything. And maybe I can be a little bit more careful when I'm going through, because I was a little bit reckless last time, like trying to figure things out and try different things. And so as soon as I had learned some stuff from that, trying it in a new file, and going through that process again, it just helped me get even more familiar with the tools as I was going through. So I have like, like I said, I had like 19 other maps before this, two of them, which actually pretty much got to this polish stage, but I wasn't happy with because there was something wrong with it. It wasn't what I wanted to show people. Uh, but my first map in this, my first everything, I, I just had like just stuff everywhere. There's just a long wall of like a tiled texture like a ramp that went to nowhere just crates and barrels and stuff which is throwing stuff in to test it out like explosions and everything things that didn't even make sense but just helped me kind of understand how the engine worked and when i say i think during the slideshow one time i i said mastering software so you can be you can have the most creative ideas and you can be the most creative person ever but if you don't know how to use the tools uh, you'll never make anything. It's kind of like a, a very short structured version of this is if, if you didn't know how to use a pencil, right? Like if you want to draw, you have to know how to use a pencil. Like if you have all these awesome ideas of things you want to make in your head, but if you don't know how to like hold a pencil, you're never going to draw anything. So once you use the engine enough, um, it's same with Maya, same with any other software. Once you use the engine enough and you don't have to think about oh, I want to make this shape. How do I make this shape? Once you get past uh, those barriers, then it just becomes second nature and you can just use all of your creative power to make anything that you want. And it's a very freeing, uh, like revelation experience. Like it's like the longest time of frustration, trying things out, having things break and being annoyed, quitting sometimes and taking a break and then going, man, am I really going to let that one crash like stopped me from all the two years that I put into this already. And then I go back, you know, after I've taken a break from it and like, all right, let me try something else. And, you know, there was many, there was, I think there was one time there was like a week and a half that nothing would launch. I was like, how, like what's happening? And I would just import stuff to drive, uninstall the tools, reinstall the tools, pull the stuff back in. And then it worked. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm good now. Like that's, that's great. And, after the, that time of being so familiar with the tools and you just get more confident the time goes on because when you run into a situation where it crashes, you're like, hey, I've seen this before. Like, I, I'm not wondering what it is. I can probably do this and it'll fix it. And it, the, the, the time of you messing around with stuff and being frustrated and trying to figure out what to do starts to diminish. And then that opens up you to be able to be more creative and have more time to make what you actually want. But you have to go through that rigorous, tough process of failing, being frustrated, and having no answers being given to you and trying to find stuff out, just messing around with things. And ultimately, that will help you with other future software. Because I didn't use Unreal a lot, um, but I used this a ton. And I used it so much that I got so familiar with it that when I went over to Unreal, there were, you know modules and terms and uh, types of software that they use with Unreal that I was like, hey, I've used this stuff like this in the Radiant engine. I'm familiar with how this works. It's a little bit different because it's a little bit different in every engine, but it was easier for me to adapt to new stuff. Um, and same thing goes with other studios because like other studios use like different engines and they're like, would you be comfortable using Unreal? I'm like, yeah, of course, because even if I'm not as familiar with Unreal as I am with the Radiant engine, I know for a fact I can problem solve and figure things out when they come up because I've already been through that. So I would definitely encourage you, especially I, I understand your frustration completely, but just keep going. Keep like, whenever something happens, just know that like there is an answer for it. You just don't know what it is yet. Just keep messing around with stuff. Start over, start a new file, like pull, like try different things. And eventually you'll get to a point where, you know, whenever something does happen, you're like, ah, I could, pr I probably know how to fix this. And your confidence will go up and your creativity will be able to expand. So I know it's kind of like a long convoluted answer for that, but that was kind of my experience. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. all of it. Of course.
Yeah, that was an awesome answer. I uh, literally made a checklist item to print out the quote. If you want to draw, you have to know how to use a pencil. <laughs> yeah, That's that, was the, that was the simplest way I could explain yeah, I an engine. Seriously. So I love it because um, like I started off developing just really simple 2D apps and 2D games. And obviously I worked with Pixel Press for a long time, but that's all we did. We, we used uh, the 2D engine from Unity, but I learned a lot, just like everything on Unity, rigid bodies, the physics engine, how to code. And like, now that I know how to use Unity really well, I can create anything with it. Like creating a virtual reality app or an augmented reality app or a 3D open world is super easy just because I know where everything is. I know that if I run into something, I can problem solve my way through it or use my resources online. Um, so yeah, I love that answer. Yeah, I trust me, I understand your frustration. I still feel some of that even with some new tools because like, I'll mess around with ZBrush, which is like a completely different beast in and of itself. Like ZBrush, I don't know who designed ZBrush, but I feel like they designed it in a way to make it the most difficult to find anything ever. Um, and it's, 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 it's the same thing with every other process. Like you start out, but uh, once you've been through that process with something, even if it's not the same software, it's like not another engine, you you just have to be comfortable being uncomfortable and frustrated and know that you've been through that kind of section before. And so you just got to keep, you know, reutilizing that process until you get to that place. Um, so like I used to, like when I was in college and I took my digital painting class with like the, like these two top pieces, like I would hand draw like everything I had. I, like, I went out and bought a Cintiq and I was like, I'm going to be a concept artist. Like, this is going to be me. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And I like, started hand drawing like each individual pebble, like on that, like I didn't even use brushes. And I was like, cause I didn't, I didn't know. Like I, I was like, everybody's hand drawing all these awesome pieces on art station. And if I'm going to get to that, like, I just have to keep doing it. But really there's like, once I figured out people just take pictures of buildings and then just import it into Photoshop and use that and paint over it a little bit. I'm like, isn't that cheating? Like what? Like they didn't hand draw all this. And my digital painting teacher said, it's fine like to cheat. Like it doesn't matter how you produce it. Obviously don't like, you know, steal other people's artwork and put it in there. But if you, you can clap, like take a bunch of different things and make it your own. It, nobody cares how you get the image done. Like when I look at a piece of concept art now, I'm like, I like it because it looks cool and it portrays the image in the scene that I think looks neat. I don't care if they hand painted it. I don't care if they took reference images from it. If you can utilize any type of process like that to make things easier, then you'll do that. So I could have just taken an image of like some pebbles or a brush, a pebble brush, and just painted over that and use some perspective on it. But I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know that process. I didn't understand that I could do that. And that's just something, just as an example of something that I learned going along the way. And then eventually I stopped doing uh, like digital painting and I moved to 3D scenes because I was like, I didn't care about the craft of digital painting. That wasn't something that was too important to me. I just wanted to take what was in my brain and just put it into a scene so that other people could see what I was thinking. And I was like, how do I make this process faster? Like, I don't want to paint everything. And I found that it was just easier for me to just portray my ideas in a three-dimensional scene because I didn't have to paint the lighting because the engine did the lighting for me and I could just make the scene a lot faster. And that's kind of how I was like, oh, maybe I'm not a concept artist. Maybe I want to do levels and environment art because it allows me to get to my final destination quicker than having to do digital paint. But that's just me. Like other people might like the craft of painting a lot more. So, but yeah. Nice. Hey, Connor, are you doing all right on time? I have all day, so I'm good. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Let's see. So I'm going to stop the sharing so we can see faces. Oh, yeah. We do have a few questions. I think, Justin, you were the first person I saw with your hand up. We have about five Justins in the game program. I'm going to guess, is this Justin Thompson? Yes. Hey, all right, Justin Thompson. Okay, so um, how many levels did you make where you just felt like you were, like, good enough to show them off to other people, like anybody at all? Um. Well, let's see here. Like, how many levels 
did I make to where I was like, this is the stuff I'm going to apply with to like other studios? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I guess like what's in my portfolio now is like my, my, my Black Ops Zombies map. It actually takes up the majority of it. Um, I put a few digital paintings on there, but like, like I said, like I had 19 other maps that I had put hundreds of hours into that I was like, I, I could see that I was getting to where I wanted to go. And I was like, all right, I know if I just keep going, keep making more maps, I'm going to eventually get to something that I'm probably going to be happy with. And I remember when I started the Isles of the Damn map and I started getting the theme that I wanted and I started making it. I was about, I don't know, a couple hours into it. And I was like, if I can get this to look the way I want it to look with everything that I've learned, I know this is good, probably going to be the piece that I use in my portfolio. And like my portfolio has, I don't know, 15, 17 things in it. There are hundreds of things that I haven't even shown anybody before. And a lot of it is just, you know, like I was talking about with uh, going through all the frustrations of trying different things, right? Uh, one of my digital painting teacher, but I'll go back to him a lot. Um, he taught me a lot of different things about not just digital painting, but just being disciplined in the, how you train yourself to become a better uh, designer, artist, or whatever. And he would a lot of times have us do a project and we put like a week's worth of work into it. And then he would make us delete it like at the end of the week. And I was like, well, like, I don't want to delete this. Like, it's cool. Like I've invested time into it. And he's like, true. Like it's, it's fine. Like if you want to keep stuff, but the whole point of that, that project was to not feel so emotionally attached to anything that you create. Like it's fine to, you know, be emotionally invested into it. Um, but like that process of deleting that and starting fresh Every time I would start a new project after that, I would be like, oh, this one's going to be even better than that. So now I don't even care about that one that I deleted. And especially five, six iterations down the line, I don't even remember that, that one at all. And so that process was to kind of help us early on just realize that um, you know, you're always going to be improving. So you don't need to hold on specifically to one thing all the time. But once you, you'll get to somewhere where you do enough iterations where you stand back and you'll have this moment and you'll be like, you know, like I freaking made that. Like, that's crazy. Like, I'm proud of this one. And then there'll be 10 projects in between that where I've set my standards even high based off of that project. So if I make something that's a little bit better than that map, I'm not as impressed with myself as I was when I had accomplished that one before that. So the more you do it, the more you'll get to a point, you'll get closer to a point where you, you'll make something and you're like, wow, like I wish five projects ago, I could have showed this to myself and like realize how far you've come. And it's a very slow process. It's like, you know, people growing, like you never notice people, you know, people growing at all. Like you just like, oh, like you're now like six feet. Like I've never seen, like I haven't seen you in five years and you're this tall now. Like it, it's just, it's just like that. You'll never really notice the changes you're doing. It's like some tiny little things. Like I said, with the digital paint, like I would paint every individual pebble. And then once I realized I could use a pebble brush, right, my process got faster. And when I could do things faster, I could focus more on what will make the piece better rather than relying on more technical stuff that I was like, how do I figure this out? So like I, like I said, I have hundreds of things in, that I haven't shown anybody. But eventually you'll get to a point where you're just like, all right, you know, I've done enough where this looks pretty good. And then I'll put it in the portfolio. And I applied to Naughty Dog with that map. And then I've kept that map in my portfolio for five years because I'm still super proud of it. And I think the reason I haven't really added too many personal projects to my portfolio is because since I'm working at AAA, I don't have the time to really make that kind of quality personal project anymore. And now it's my professional you know, portfolio. I use the, the levels I worked on at work as my professional portfolio because those are the best pieces. Um, but before I started working on there, yeah, that zombie map is probably my last really big personal project. And you'll get to a point where you're happy with that. 
Um, and I didn't have personally have this point where I kept updating my portfolio because I just got the job at Naughty Dog. But I've had a friend, uh, the guy I talked about who just got a job recently, the only other guy that graduated with us. His portfolio kept evolving. And he he had struggled with a lot of things while we were in college, like trying to figure out what he wanted. And, you know, his technical abilities weren't the best, um, but he was still really passionate about, you know, wanting to be in the industry. And eventually after he'd worked on so many iterations, I remember checking his art station. I was like, damn, like that looks so good. I remember when his stuff was like, he was struggling. I remember when he couldn't really come up with anything creative and he just kept working on stuff. And eventually he, uh, after all of the learning he had from those projects, he eventually came up with uh, a couple of pieces that he was proud to put on his art station. And that eventually got him that job there. So, you know, everybody works at their own pace. There isn't like a set like, oh, like I'm going to work for six months on a project and that'll be enough time for me to make a piece that I'm happy with. Um, but I wouldn't say don't wait too long to, to show somebody something like if, if, you know, you're never going to be fully satisfied with the work you're doing. Um, and so sometimes you're just going to have to say, all right, well, this is my best work yet. Um, I'm probably going to make better stuff, but I should just use this as my portfolio piece for now. And if I keep making better stuff, I can replace it, um, and switch it out. But, um, yeah, it takes a while to understand, you know, what you'll be happy with because everybody's everybody's creative mind is a little bit different um so like for me it took you know 19 maps to come up with that one that i liked and it was a those 19 maps were thousands of hours more than i'd spent actually on that map itself so pretty much it was all of that 3000 to get me to that work so it it just depends but yeah i wouldn't say don't wait too long Definitely put something up on your portfolio. If you're ready to apply, just pick your best work uh, for right now and use that uh, while you're applying and then just update it as you, as you work on new stuff because you'll, you'll always be improving. So, Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Connor. I think we've got four questions. So Sure. Yeah, I'll we'll answer as many. Cool. All right, Mitch, I think you were the uh, most recent with your hand up. Yeah, mine's more of a more boring um, career-based question, I guess. So sure. um, is it more common for people to move studio to studio after a big project's finished? Or is there the option to stay at the same place and continue working on whatever comes next? And I guess the caveat to that, too, would be like, you know, with like retirements and benefits and all that fun stuff that come along with working at a company, how easy, I guess, do they make that transition going from one studio to the next? Yeah. So uh, I'll share an experience, at least when I got finished with Ragnarok. So when I was at Naughty Dog, <clears throat> um, that that job was a regular level designer position. So uh, it's a little bit different everywhere usually there's like intern junior mid which is what i started at at naughty dog i kind of skipped the junior level because i feel like the portfolio that i had kind of had pushed me past that junior level uh quality uh so i started at mid but it was a contract role these are very very popular in the games industry um a lot of times uh depending on where the studio is at in their production right uh there's pre-production where uh the president, the leads, and the senior developers are kind of deciding what the game is. And the studio isn't very big at that time. The studio is kind of a evolving shape as the production of the game goes on. Because like as a level designer, um, I'm not going to be making levels when we're trying to figure out like what are we even making sometimes like it's going to be concept phase like our concept art's going to be like coming up with ideas and like it's different priorities there and so the studio will be at its smallest after the game's over because you know they don't need 300 400 people working on that and so they'll bring people on as development goes when they need people and so a lot of times those will be contract roles for like a year and a lot of times so you know if you're good and you're you're working well they'll extend your contract till the end of the game um or at least until the breadth of your work is done so 
Um, when I started at Naughty Dog, it was a one-year contract. Um, and I'll share salaries with uh, you guys because you know, I'm all about being transparent and definitely making sure that you guys understand like what pays acceptable for certain types of things like that and like the year terms for that. So when I got hired at Naughty Dog, it was one year for 76000 uh, for that year. And I was uh, allowed overtime, um, as much overtime as I wanted there. Uh, so, and out in California, at least if you work at a studio in California, the overtime hours are really great benefits because you can work an hour, uh, every hour over eight hours is a time and a half year hourly rate. And every hour over 12 hours is literally double your rate, which is crazy. Um, but that contract was for a year. So I worked for a year and about three months before that contract was coming to an end, uh, my managers come and say, Hey, you know, we like what you're doing. Uh, we're going to extend your contract by about six months. Um, and so six months would go by and I was like, okay, so like, I know I'm going to be here six months. I'm going to keep working. And then I, I, I pretty much knew I was going to be extended all the way to the end of the game, but I did not know if they were going to keep me or not. So that was, I had to keep that in the back of my head. And if a studio is responsible with, you know, taking care of their employees, they will tell you two to three months in advance whether they're going to keep you or not based on a contract role. And at Naughty Dog, they weren't going to keep me, right? And obviously, I was very frustrated by that because I was like, I put all this time and effort and I worked my ass off and you know, I made some really, really good levels there. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes it's not down to like whether they really like you as an employee because their publishers most of the time have the last say. They're like, you can keep this many employees because we need this kind of budget in here. So you got to let this amount of people go. And at the end of uh, Last of Us Part Two, they let a lot of people go, like 200 probably, which was insane. So a lot of people looking for work, right? Now, um, since I was on contract there, I was through a different company called Yo, and they work with a contracted company that hires them there. I was still on the team. I was still part of the company, right? I was still working in the same area there. Um, but since I'd already worked there um, at a Sony studio, it was a lot easier for me to get somebody within that studio to recommend me to the Santa Monica studio. And that's how I easily moved over there. And now something, uh, unfortunately, this is just how it is. Uh, the earlier you start interviewing, the better. It takes a very, very long time to start the interview process, or not just start the interview process, from applying to you actually starting. So Rainbow Studios, the one I'm starting with now, I applied to that like two months ago or something like that. And uh, I'd interviewed at Treyarch over the past five, six months. That interview process took three months. It was crazy. And it ended with them saying, eh, you're really good, but you're six months shy of how much experience we want for this role. And so there was three months, right? And so a lot of the times that section at the end of like Naughty Dog, they let me know about three months uh, that my contract was going to end. They weren't going to keep me. And I was like, all right, well, you know, I can be as upset as I want, but let me take this time to make sure that I leave on a really good note. Like, I'm not frustrated. I'm not, you know, treating people bad. Like, I want to make sure that I keep these contacts and these connections as good connections that I can relate back to. Because the industry, like I said, it's a multi billion dollar industry, but the industry is very small. People talk with everybody all the time. Like, I worked with people at Naughty Dog who worked at EA, worked at Bethesda. Everybody works everywhere. And so it's very easy for people to be like, to call up a studio up and be like, hey, had you worked with Connor? Like, how is he? And sometimes that will be a, a make or break almost all the time. So definitely utilize uh, the studio you're at. If they say they're going to let you go or contract, just talk to the people in there because most of the time somebody's worked at another studio that can get you a contact over there. And one of the scripters I worked with uh, worked at Santa Monica Studio previously on God of War 2018. And he was like, oh, well, it sucks that you're leaving, but I know all the level designers over there. Let me just get you in contact with them. And that just fast-tracked my application through the regular application process. And it was another contract role. Now, I was super frustrated 
that I was like, you know, I want a full-time position. You still get benefits on the contract role. You still get healthcare. Uh, you still get all the typical stuff. You won't get a 401k or anything like that, but you'll have the basic, you know, things that you need to survive and to protect yourself. Um, but that was another contract role at Santa Monica studio for two years. And so I was like, you know, I want a full-time position. Um, but contract roles, um, are great for you getting experience at studios and moving around because it lets you get in the studio and then use the people you work with to get your other jobs. Um, and also you can stay at a studio for a long time. Studios want to be able to keep you if they can, uh, because they want you to be invested in their products for long-term. But I will say this, it is much easier to get pay raises from moving to a different studio. Like you'll get a raise annually, probably at a studio. Um, I remember the second year I was at Naughty Dog, I got a $10,000 raise at the end of that, which was pretty crazy. So I was up at 86,000 uh, once I moved there. Um, but then when I moved over to Santa Monica studio, they, instead of doing probably another five grand uh, raise at Naughty Dog, they offered me 15,000 more a year than what I was making for the same, a mid-level position. So doesn't necessarily mean you'll get higher pay based on where you work. Sometimes it all count, comes down to, oh, he has, we're still hiring for a mid-level designer, but he has four years of experience. So we're going to pay him more than somebody who has two years. And so I was kind of, you know, I was making good money, but I was frustrated, you know, I was still working contract roles. Um, but most of the time, that's probably going to be your best bet outside of internships of what you're going to be in first, it's probably it's very difficult to land a full-time position um, at a game studio because especially if you have no experience, uh, people want to contract you just to make sure that you, know, you work really well with them. They don't want to make a full-time commitment with you if you don't have the experience to back it up. So contracts are very, you know, very popular within the game industry. And as soon as the game comes out, they'll probably let most of the people go. Um, most of the time, it's not based on your performance. It's based on budget. Um, so just be ready for that. Um, and yeah, it is frustrating, but it's definitely the easiest way uh, to just get the experience. And with Rainbow Studios, this is my first full-time position. Like, you know, I've worked at these Titan Industries and I've done the exact same work a full-time person would have done. But now I have enough experience to get that full-time position. So it's just kind of how that stuff works. It's all over the place and you got to be very comfortable with moving to a different studio um, if that's inevitable. So just be prepared for that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your transparency on that question. I think we've got three more questions. Uh, there's two in the chat, so I'll read them out loud. The first one's from Will Etter. So he says, do studios look for people with experience with specific software or do they just want people to be proficient with a software of their choice? Maya versus Blender, for example. Um, so hmm. in my personal experience, Blender is definitely more, oh, Blender's free. So mm -hmm. it's definitely more, uh, it's easier to obtain. I would say Blender is really good for, you know, uh, tutorializing yourself with 3D software. Um, I would say if you only have Blender and not 3DS Max or Maya uh, on your portfolio, that's probably, if you have Maya and 3DS Max on your portfolio, it's going to, it's going to put you above anybody else who doesn't have that on there. Cause it, uh, Maya's, well, hmm. Because Blender's definitely made some really good updates uh, nowadays. I've used Blender for different purposes, different reasons. They have a lot of better plugins that serve for different types of utilities. I would say be familiar with both of them. Like be comfortable enough to put both on uh, your resume because, you know, you at Naughty Dog at Santa Monica Studio, we primarily used Maya. Uh, Blender was, I, I know I said before, they'll usually have some software that you can go back and forth between there. It was 3ds max or Maya, but Maya was pretty prominent and 3ds max and Maya are pretty similar. So they're both Autodesk. Um, so I would say definitely be familiar with both, 
but I would say Maya would definitely be more attractive to be on uh, a portfolio rather than Blender, um, at least in my experience for big AAA companies. Um, Blender will definitely let uh, the company know that you understand how 3D software works. And I don't think it would be too, you know, too much of a difference between the two, but I would say if they see Maya, they see 3ds Max or any Autodesk software, they're going to be like, oh, okay. They know how to use 3D software and they know how to use the one that's probably the most capable for what we're working with. So a lot of times you can just Google and be like, what software does a company use? Do they use uh, different types of 3D software? Do they use ZBrush versus some other sculpting program? Um, I don't put Blender on my resume, uh, mostly because, I mean, I've used it a couple of times when I'm proficient in Maya, but I would just say, make sure to be familiar with both. And that goes for engines too, I guess. Unreal is a big one. Uh, since I used Radiant a lot, I put Radiant prominently on my, my top engines list. Um, and I didn't have Unreal on there for a little bit. And a lot of studios use Unreal. And a lot of times I applied to places, they were like, well, you know how to use the Radiant engine. Are you familiar with Unreal? And I was just honest. And I was like, well, I haven't used Unreal in a little bit, but I probably need to, you know, to do a refresher. Don't ever say that. <laughs> that that definitely uh, will be like, oh, well, he probably just doesn't know Unreal at all. So definitely be familiar enough with the mainstream software like Maya and Unreal. And then if you want to primarily use Blender uh, for your personal projects, that's totally fine. Uh, but companies will want to make sure that you understand how the main software works as well. Awesome. Okay. The next one's from, oh, Will's still here. Cool. Glad you're here for that, Will. Um, from Jason. So he says, wanted to ask, what was the most difficult thing you did while making The Last of Us Part Two? Yeah. Uh, the horse chase was definitely the most difficult thing. And it's the most, it's the thing I'm most proud of, even outside of anything I worked on in Ragnarok. Um, so the horse chase, for those of you who haven't played it, um, is about a two minute sequence. Uh, and it took about seven months to make that sequence there. The reason it took so long um, is because uh, that set piece, uh, I worked primarily with a script designer, uh, like I was a level designer and then my counterpart was the scripting designer uh, that would work with me directly for any heavy scripting things that needed to happen. Um, so me and him uh, were started working on the horse chase. For me, it was, uh, there was a horse chase in The Last of Us Part 1 uh, where Ellie is like escaping um, in the winter time from like the cannibal people or something like that. And my lead came up to me and he was like, we want to mirror this horse chase. We want to have another version of this. Uh, but for Abby, uh, when she's escaping the village. Um, so he told me in his own words, and he made the original horse chase. He was like, I'm the one who made this one. Just do this, but do it better. And I was like, oh, shit, dude. Like, what are you talking about? Like, the lead told me, it's like, just make something better than what I made. I was like, all right, well, we'll see what I can do. Um, so we started off um, uh, using an already implemented horse mechanic because uh, in Last of Us Part Two, there's uh, a lot of open world spaces where you can use the horse to freely roam around in. So we had, the, we had the horse mechanic that worked like that. You could run around anywhere. So we actually used a, a version of that horse uh, vehicle for our horse chase, but the horse chase was kind of on rails a little bit. It gave you kind of a window of space uh, to move around in. We kind of had these barriers that you couldn't go past. And it was kind of like a, you couldn't turn around, you couldn't go backwards, but you could kind of guide the horse a little bit. You could make decisions uh, on which direction you wanted to go through the burning village and stuff. Like there'd be a split path and you could be like, oh, I want to go to the left. And if you went on the left, the horse would guide itself through that path. And then you could like continue shooting like whatever enemies were going on there. And we were working on that for, I don't know, about a month or two. Uh, I had gotten the level uh, 
iteration to kind of where we were happy with, with pacing, uh, where we wanted each sequence to happen. So we wanted it to be the most action-packed, like Hollywood movie, like uh, sequence of the entire game. Like that's kind of what they put me in charge of. And I was like, I can't believe they let me, a new person, work on the one of the biggest set pieces of the game. Like I was very intimidated. So I was like, I have to do this right. I have to make sure this is really good. Um, and through our production on that, I think after a month and a half of working on it, we got in the level, like I said, where we wanted it to be. And then uh, the horse mechanic in the open world space would change because they were making changes to the open world section on how the horse behaved. And so we would get an email one morning and it'd be like, the horse now listens to this type of ground collision, which we had not even built the level to even listen to at the time. Like we didn't care about ground collision. We cared about these, these walls on the side for collision that the horse listened to and went back and forth. And so once that change got implemented, when somebody pushes something, we use Perforce uh, at those studios, when somebody pushed a global change, every morning we would pull data to you know, be on latest data. So we're working on the most up-to-date things while we're building stuff. And the horse would just break. Like we couldn't even run through the level. The level didn't function properly anymore. The spaces um, between like certain sections, we'd have like a split path decision where you could go through a burning house or you could go like around a bus. And if you went around the bus, there was a guy on top of the bus that would try to jump on the horse or something. And then there would be somebody that ran out from the bushes that like tried to trip you or, and a certain sequence would happen over there. And if you went over on the burning house side, uh, like the house would collapse a little bit and some like debris would fall on you and you'd have to like maneuver out. Um, and those were so specific, like we timed those up specifically to happen so that you know, every player would have that perfect experience every time they went through that. And so when the horse mechanic would change, all of that got thrown off, like everything broke. And we're like, what, like, what are we supposed to do if this keeps changing? So me and my scripter had to create our own horse vehicle pretty much for that. And as a level designer, I, it was completely uncharted territory for me. I was like, well, I don't even know how to even go about this. So luckily, um, uh, you know, we work with other people who they specialize in stuff like that. My scripter specialized in tech design. So he was very comfortable with creating a one-off version of that. But I was definitely there to help him make sure that it felt right and it felt good going through that. Uh, so for me, I had to change how the level uh, looked. I had to change how the level was spaced. Um, and eventually we made it, since we had our own one-off version, we could actually manipulate multiple different types of things about that vehicle without changing the open world horse mechanic. So it actually made us, it gave us a little bit more freedom to do some more exciting things with that vehicle since it was our own thing. Now we had to convince the leads and the president to give us three more months of production time to make that because we were like, if the horse mechanic and the open world section keeps changing, we're never going to get this done in time time for ship because with the seven months that seventh month was like two months before we finalized the game so we did not have another seven months to keep making changes so we had to convince them the leads go up pitch why we needed to take two months to create this alternate horse mechanic um, and then once we had that we and we were confident the horse wasn't going to change and we had more freedom to make these like really cool set pieces that's all we did pretty much for like four months. We're like, how do we make this more exciting? Can we change the speed of the horse? Can we, do we want to let them slow the horse down? And if this horse slows down, like how does that affect the animations of the guys jumping off the bus and like getting on? Cause we needed to make sure that every time you went through, no matter what speed, no matter what position, or no matter what choice you made, every time you made it, it felt like that was the sequence you were supposed to go through but also gave the player the feeling that they were making the choices through that. So kind of like they were playing a little bit of a movie. Um, and that was the most difficult thing to do because we had seven different action sequences throughout that entire thing. And we would have this really like claustrophobic neighborhood area that we would go through that had a bunch of split decisions. And then it would open up into a large field. And then we we're like, oh, well, this doesn't work well with the the speed that we're allowed to take the horse down and we had to get like 
increase how much you could turn. And then there were like three or four different other like enemy horses that would come in from the sides and they all had to match the speed that which you were going at, but also be in the same places for you to be able to like have combat with them. And then you would go into the burning village area, which would be another, it would condense back down like the neighborhood and it would go back to different sequences like that. Um, and so that was all over the place. Each different sequence had their own challenges. And especially when the horse mechanic would change, that would just, it was constantly throwing wrenches um, in anything that we were trying to do. But ultimately, you know, after we got our own one-off version of that and we kind of like buckled down for like four months, we finally, finally got a version that we were happy with. And it felt like every decision you made, every different combination of paths that you could choose felt like a, a cinematic, perfect path through that. And that was like, that's when I was working hundred hours a week. Cause I was like, I could, I could work 40 hours a week and just do the bare minimum and have this be like a, ah, eh, you just ride through this village or we could work our ass off and make sure that this is like the perfect way to end Abby's section here. So that was the, the most difficult thing I've ever had to work on. But I look back on that. And I'm like, like, that's definitely my, my trophy for the thing I'm most proud of. So very cool. We're going to have to play that in my class coming up. Soon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we've got one more question from Mateo. Mateo, are you still here? Yeah, yeah I'm still here. Um, my question is kind of a follow-up, I guess, because you just said you really enjoyed working on this. And my question was going to be, uh, is there a project you enjoyed working on the most and why? But I guess you kind of answered it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely say... Well, I would say the one I'm most proud of is different than the one that I enjoyed working on uh, the most. So it comes pretty close. So Ragnarok, I worked on uh, without spoiling anything, um, a lot of spaces within Svartalfheim. And there's an area called the Forge, uh, which is definitely some more open areas uh, to explore around some more of that wide linear um, design I talked about earlier where there's still kind of one path to go, but there's many options to go off and explore and try some different things. There's like a triple chest over there that has some runes. Um, there's some extra combat. If you go around a different path, uh, Ragnarok, we, uh, one of our biggest things that we changed about the level design was how you get around the traversal is very different so in 2018 um it was very grounded a lot of things you could do was just kind of mantle up some ledges drop down ledges um and in this one we definitely opened it up to like you could grapple up to certain ledges you can hang off of different sides of things and go around and it kind of opened up uh, a lot of new opportunities for us to create more interesting types of level design and flow with uh, those characters. Um, so I definitely enjoyed uh, the freedom of coming up with new ways to play as Kratos in those areas. I definitely had the most fun uh, like working with that and being kind of like the pioneer of those new traversals. And it kind of gave me, it's like, nobody's ever, you know, everybody's played as Kratos before, but nobody's played as him in these types of ways. And so I was like, I kind of felt like I was on the ground creating exactly what the game was going to be. So I definitely had the most fun uh, doing that. But also, I think the one I was the most time I was the most giddy about, like, I can't believe I get to go to work and like do this every day was the descent um, in Last of Us Part Two, that creepy, like, descent down the skyscraper going through all the the broken skyscraper where like the the infected were like melted into the walls and they were like trapped zombies and for me i love horror stuff anything has to do with horror so as soon as they're like yeah you're gonna be working on the the skyscraper descent where and just create something that's claustrophobic and terrifying and i was like that's awesome like i can't believe i get to go to work and say what's going to be more scary to have a bloater burst out of the wall or is there going to be some trap like infected in the walls, like maybe I should do some like eye beam where people have to balance and then something jumps out of them. Like, do they fall down onto like a mattress or something that saves them? Like all of those types of things was like, when I was a kid, like if I could go back and tell myself as a kid, I'm like, you're going to be like making cool, creepy shit, like for your job one day. That's definitely the, 
the most entertaining thing I, I worked on, so. Awesome, Connor, thank, thank you. you, let's see. Yeah, thanks Mateo for the question. Um, any final questions before we dispatch? Okay, man, two hours flies by. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just gonna add something real quick. Um, I know, you know, maybe some of you haven't asked any questions yet. Um, I was gonna ask Matthew, sorry if I dropped my LinkedIn here um, and just don't be afraid to reach out to me. Some of you already have. Um, so sorry, I haven't been able to get back to you yet, but any questions that you think about afterwards, just, just send them over to me. I like, I'll, I'll be on there at times, you know, and I'll reach out if you want me to look at your portfolio, you know, give you any feedback on, you know, any stuff like that. Uh, just don't be afraid to reach out and ask me any questions you can think of. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for being so accepting for students reaching out. Um, yeah. cool. So if you didn't see it, Connor, just put his LinkedIn in the chat. I'll also put it in our Discord. We have a Discord for these meetings too, Connor. Okay. Uh, and then do you have a link to your portfolio by chance? Yeah. Let's see here. It should be right here. Cool. Like I said, I just use Wix. Nothing special. Didn't even yeah. make a domain. So it's fine. Yeah. But, Wix is great. Yeah. yeah you create your portfolio um, for free, right? You don't need a domain. Like if you do it without the domain, you can just use Wix for free. Yeah, use Wix for free. You can pay like, I don't know, what is like three, five dollars a month or something for a domain, but like I said, it doesn't really matter. So cool. Awesome, Connor. You had so many golden nuggets of info for her. So thank you for your time. Um, yeah, I'll post the the links that you sent also on our Discord, everybody. And then we'll have this on YouTube too. So if you want to revisit everything, um, you can rewatch the video. All right. Cool. Sounds Connor, good. Yeah, thanks yeah. so much. Man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm hoping we can do more things like this in the future. So thank you. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys.